When I was in about third grade, um, I was in Catholic school, and it was tough in those days, and um, I learned a word that I'd call a $2.50 word. It was a big one, hyperbole. I never forgot it, hyperbole. Hyperbole is gross exaggeration to make a point. And it's very prominent in literature, but we all use hyperbole. For example, you're the oldest son or daughter in this family, and you've got three brothers and sisters younger than you. And your mom goes to the market, your dad's at work, and your mom says, get those kids to clean up their room. So she goes out, and the oldest brother starts saying, you know, you've got to clean the room, mom said. And I don't want to do it. And none of the kids here would act like that, I'm sure. But, you know. So finally, this older brother, in desperation, finally says this, you better clean your room or mom's going to kill you. That's hyperbole. Mom's not going to kill them. But we say things like that, you know, um, and, and we all do it. We all exaggerate sometimes to make a point. And especially for little ones, when we say things like that, sometimes it's motivational. It's motivational out of fear, but it often works. Well, the Bible is literature like any other book, and people wrote it, and they used hyperbole because hyperbole works, I guess. However, today I want to cite some hyperbole that I hope it doesn't work on you. And if anybody has a God that's like this, don't introduce him to me or her. I don't want to know this God. Listen what it says in the book of Exodus. Thus says the Lord, You shall not molest or an alien, for you were once aliens yourself in the land of Egypt. You shall not wrong any widow or, or, or orphan. If you ever wrong them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. So far, so good. Beautiful. And then the Lord says, My wrath will flare up and I will kill you with the sword. I will kill you with the sword. Oh, please. Really? And then this word of God has the nerve to say right after that, because I have compassion. I will hear him, the, the one who gets harmed, for I am compassionate who will kill you with the sword. Compassionate only to some people, I guess, and not compassionate toward those who do evil. Well, again, I suppose in the early beginnings of faith history, um, to get people who believed in all kinds of gods, for example, if you go down to Mexico, there's a god of the sun, a god of the moon, uh, a god of the corn, a god of the fish, a god of the sea. Uh, and in all parts of the world, people had all kinds of gods. And probably tied to your commerce. If you were uh, in Kansas where they grow corn and you didn't believe in God, the God of Abraham and, and Isaac and Jacob, you maybe believed in a, a corn god and you prayed to the corn god to protect the corn crop. There it is. But in this relationship with this God, something is being asked of us. And today's scriptures, even though they're using hyperbole, ask a bunch of things of us. In the first reading, it's to be... Be faithful to God and take care of people, to love people, because it cites in particular orphans and widows. You know, women couldn't inherit in the time of Jesus and certainly uh, way back to Abraham, couldn't inherit anything. If the husband died, they lost everything. It went to the son. And, um, and many, depending on the son, many a woman would, it says in the Bible, go out and had to become prostitutes in order just to survive. And so um, it was tough. And orphans, even today, if, if a child loses both parents, my God, one's bad enough to lose, but both is just horrific. And they become an orphan, and, and what, do they get tossed around, foster care forever, or what? So to show compassion, God is saying, this is what good people do. They show compassion, especially to the weak and the vulnerable. Well, the second reading Paul writes to the Thessalonians to a people who once were idolaters who had turned to this God and were living good, wholesome, and holy lives. And he congratulates them and encourages them. Keep it up. Keep it up. You're doing the good thing. But it's the gospel that gets interesting. And um, I don't think the gospel is hyperbolic. But to really appreciate this gospel, you have to, it is better if you know one little thing. Now, I always refer you to 
USCCB.org, which stands for United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, USCCB. And if you go there, uh, you get this beautiful picture, and there's a, one of those three lines on the top right. You click on it, and it opens up a box, and the first thing says daily readings. And if you click on daily readings, you'll get the readings of the Mass of the Day. You'll get all three of these readings in the responsorial psalm. Um, but before each of the readings, like the Gospel, on the right side, there's a little citation where it comes from. And in this case, it's Matthew 22, verses 22 to 33. And um, in it, you, you go to the, it'll open up the Bible, the page in the Bible, and if you look at it, the, there was a passage we heard a week ago, and then this passage, but there's a middle passage that's not in any of the readings of the church during this time. And this middle passage was this. It's an interesting one. Um, the Jews had a law called the Leveret Law, Leveret and the Leveret Law said, if I'm married to my wife Sarah and I die without us producing a son, a son because only sons could inherit, then my next brother, I'll just go down the line in my family, Barry. Barry has to marry Sarah. Um, and if he doesn't, with her, produce a son, then the next brother, Terry, has to marry Sarah. And it goes on like that because the point was you had to produce a son. Now, if they had a son, it wasn't technically, technically it was their son, but it was considered the son of Perry. So Terry produces my son because my son inherits from daddy, not my brother, unless no sons are produced. Now, why this became important for the Jews was because they understood God to make a promise to them. If you follow me and believe in me and follow my commands, I will make you a mighty nation with your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands on the shore of the sea. Remember that? It's a famous passage. So, be faithful to me and I will make you prosperous. You will become a mighty, mighty nation. But if the brothers don't want to produce the son because they want the inheritance, you see the lever at law said, no, you produce your brother's son. He gets the inheritance. If there no, is no brother's son, then the next brother gets it. If there's no the next one. Okay? So, in the passage it's missing in our liturgies. We had one a week ago, this one, and in the middle, it's not in our Mass. Um, the Sadducees were posing a question to Jesus. And they were always trying to trip him up. To, just like today, they're trying to catch him, to have him make a mistake. That's what they were looking for. So they said to Jesus, quoting the Leverett Law, Jesus, we'd like your opinion on this because you know everything. If this man and his wife die childless, then the next brother has to marry. And if they die childless, then the next brother has to marry her. And if they die childless, the next brother. And it says, so this woman had seven brothers that she married because each one died. Finally, when she dies, she goes to heaven, who will be her husband? Because she had seven husbands. Now, you already know this is fishy, because the number seven is the number of perfection. Anytime you hear the word seven, that means uh, it's complete, it's perfect, you can't do any more. So this is a perfect leveret law in this case. Seven brothers marrying, dying, without ever producing a son. So who will be her husband in heaven? And Jesus says, you hypocrites, you fools, you're doing it again, creating a stupid and exaggerated example. Uh, this is hyperbole, hyperbole, for what purpose? And he catches them. So they go away upset. So our gospel, following that passage in the middle, it starts like this. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, you hypocrites, you fools, they gathered together, the Pharisees, and one of them now, a scholar of the law, like a lawyer, comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, we have a question for you, because you know everything. And then the gospel today is what they present, and this is the question. Which is the first and the greatest of all the commandments? And Jesus answered correctly, correctly because all the Jews would say it's the Shema. 
And the Shema was, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Um, they wrote it over the doorpost. They put it on phylacteries, on, on uh, scrolls, and wrapped them around their hands. They, they said it three or four times a day. Like we say hello, they would say, the, the, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Everybody knew that. But Jesus goes further. They asked clearly for the first and greatest commandment, not commandments, one commandment. So Jesus gives it, but then he says, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, which is evidenced by that first reading today. You love the orphans and the widows. Take care of them. Be compassionate. And then he adds something more. He says, this these commandments, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, are worth more than any law and any prophet, which is exactly what the Jews followed, the law and the prophets. And we could add, as Christians, it's worth more than anything in the gospel to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The only difference I would make, I'd reverse them to say, first, you love yourself with all your flaws all my sins, all my moles, we got to love ourselves. And if we truly love ourselves, we probably won't find it too hard to love other people who also have flaws and sins and moles, because we all got them. And then if we're doing that, loving ourselves truly and loving one another, we're already loving God. That's what he asks of us. Love one another. Be compassionate. Now, this is not hyperbole. When he says it's worth more than anything, even all the law and the prophets, it's because it, it, the most simple and most direct way of teaching us, loving God and neighbor and self is where it's at, although I reverse it, loving self, neighbor, and then God. Now, we've got two young men here, mariachis, I think, uh, and um, they probably didn't understand a whole bunch of what I just said. I get it. And Les over there with Dylan hasn't a clue what I just said. He's only thinking pampers and leche. That's the only thing that matter, right? And mommy and daddy's hugs, too, of course. But parents and godparents, you are saying you're going to teach them what I was just talking about. You're going to teach them the two greatest commandments. And you're not going to just teach it in word, but by example. Because they are like human sponges. They listen to everything. Say a dirty word today and see if they don't say it right after you. They'll, they'll hear it. They'll catch it. And especially if people react laughing, like you all just laughed when I said that, oh, they'll say it because they watch and listen to everything, especially to the people they love the most. So you have enormous power and influence in their lives to teach them about this Jesus, to teach them about that experience on the cross, to teach them about what he said and what he himself tried to live. And you don't even need to use hyperbole just to teach him as he said it. But also you have to unwrap the hyperbole, the bad hyperbole, like God's going to slay us with a sword. Please remove that. Uh, or if you say it, at least explain it. That's just trying to get you to do it. Just trying to get you to do it. But today, we now take them to the waters. And I'm going to go over there alone right now and, and ask you all to extend your hands over the waters. And I'm going to bless the water. Because the water is the primary symbol of baptism. Um, Without oxygen, that's the first and most important thing. We, we die really soon if we don't have oxygen. Second, it's not food, it's water. We need water. And so it's the most basic, one of the most basic um, things in life just to give us life. But these spiritual waters do the same, but in a spiritual way. It's not magical, it's spiritual. And through these waters, just like the waters that give physical life, we want to see these waters and see them as giving spiritual life. 